today's presentation is on the PCB design of switch mode power supplies, also known as SMPS or switchers. We're mainly we talking about DC to DC switch mode power supplies in this series and how to design them on a PCB board and different things to look for for troubleshooting. So why switch mode power supplies and not linear regulators? Um, as you can see on the right here, we got very small linear regulators. They are take up very little space and extremely easy. Um, normally require very little troubleshooting after they're mounted. Um, number one reason, and the main reason that switch mode power supplies are used are for efficiency. If you have 20 volt input to, and you want a five volt output, that voltage just can be taken off the top and you are going to lose all of that power with a 25% efficiency output. If you use a switch mode power supply, you will maintain your um, power output and you can get close to 100%. Next is that your output voltage has to be less than your input voltage if you're using a linear voltage regulator and you switch mode power supplies, you can have higher voltages. And you also cannot reverse the polarity of the output voltages. And this is very important when you get uh, deeper into PCB design. Um, ideally, switch mode power supplies only use your capacitors, your inductors, and your switches. And those are ideal components. And they use no resistors. And you can ideally get 100% efficiency. In reality, we don't get that. And also resistors are used in a lot of switch mode power supplies for various reasons. The most important thing that can be said about switch mode power supplies is data sheets. Read the data sheets, read them again, then read them again. You need to find data sheets with good example designs before you start building your PCB. Uh, implementing everything in the reference design and making sure it meets all the, the specs from the reference design is key in making sure that your design is going to work. Uh, when you can't find a data sheet with an example layout, make sure you contact the manufacturers. They will be able to provide these for you when you can't find them. Um, good suppliers are always key in this, um, ensuring that you have a supplier that has good documentation and that their documentation is accurate. They just, they just didn't throw the first design they found in there, making sure that they have meticulously gone through their designs and know that they work. So. Um, this, if it were that easy, this would be the end of the video and we would have nothing else to go over, but of course, nothing is that easy. So some reasons that you can't always just use an example design or a layout provided by a manufacturer is because for one, you can have major components that are different in size and shape. Uh, your circuit functionalities could be omitted or added to a design. You could have mechanical restrictions on your PCB. You have uh, a lot of times it becomes a board density issue when you're trying to build an extremely small board. You have proximity to other components. Um, additional thermal requirements can constrain your design. Uh, testing requirements and fine pitch parts requiring thinner copper weights. You can have uh, larger VIA requirements due to board thickness or reliability concerns and different number of PCB layers. If you're looking at a eight layer design and you're only working with a two layer board, um, that you're probably gonna have a different design or vice versa. So there's two types of DC to DC switch mode power supplies that you'll likely work with and that's your non-isolated and your isolated. Now, the most important thing when you're working with your SMPS is your critical power paths. And that's what you have to recognize in any switch mode power supply you're designing is what is your critical power paths. And your AC current loops are the most critical connections in any switch mode power supply layout. And you can see in here on the inside it is your AC. And this may not be so obvious if it's not drawn out in a nice schematic like this. You really have to find out where on your PCB layout this critical AC power path is. Their placement, the placement of the AC power path and routing needs to be 
planned first before any other PCB layout is done around the switch mode power supply. You need to be routing with short, low inductance paths. Your uh, paths are going to, these paths are going to take priority over everything else. So always start with these. And normally in the reference designs, these should be very short, low impedance paths as short as possible. The longer these paths are, the more they act as antennas. So even if the design is telling you to make a long path, that is your switch mode power supply may not be operating in the end and isn't going to be up to the specs you want it to be. Some design rules that you should always follow is always place all your power components on the same side of the board. Um, they should be all connections made without vias. Then your return paths need to be made with vias without any thermal relief. Um, your return paths should also uh, mimic your uh, power paths on the opposite side of the board. So you shouldn't have a return path that's way longer than a uh, um, power path on the other side. Um, your output rectifier should always be placed very close to the magnetic elements and the return path to your C in your circuit. You should always have a single point ground separating your AC, AC and DC paths. Um, your AC return path should match your forward paths as much as possible. We already talked about that. That's uh, important. You go through your vias, they need to try to match what's on the other side of the board. And then a full ground plane on layer two under the switching power supply is a must have for all switch mode power supplies. If you're working with a one layer board, you might have to do um, some additional calculations and take some additional precautions, but that full ground plane is going to uh, cancel out the magnetic fields and reduce the EMI in your circuit. And that is going to make your circuit much more it's important to mention that these AC power paths and the DC power paths that we're saying to isolate, you need to ensure that you know <clears throat> that there are two separate AC power paths in this non-isolated loop here. And these need to be separated and isolated from one another as well. And the data sheets coming from the manufacturers will guide you in uh, different isolation methods for these. But ensure you know that these are not one AC loop. They need to be separated and treated as two separate loops. Now, I don't want to sound like I'm being redundant here. I'm only coming back to this point because it is extremely important. You need to make your switch nodes, your switch node as small as possible. It needs to be low impedance and as short as possible so it's not acting as an antenna. This is probably the number one reason that people fail first times making switch mode power supplies and a lot of people avoid them because of that and it really hurts their future designs because of it. Now you also need to protect, protect and not locate these components near any other circuitry or switches because they are very high noise circuits. Your analog ground plane needs to be separated from your digital ground plane on your board itself so you're not causing any issues or interference on your chips on the board. And all your other lines need to be made as small as possible. Um, you need to realize which of your lines are going to have more noise on them, which ones are frequency dependent, and ensure that those are short, low impedance lines. One of the first slides we started with is what we're going to end with here. Read the data sheet, read it again, and read it again. Make sure you're working from an extremely good example design. If you do, are not working with a complex board with a lot of constraints, implementing the exact design from a manufacturer can ensure success over 90% of the time. I know many students who have built boards out for the very first time and they were just meticulous about designing it exactly how they found the documentation told them to. So if you follow that, you will have a much greater chance of success on your first try with switch mode power supplies. 
As always, thanks for watching, and you can watch my other video on designing PCBs for debugging and your first board spins. This will have some more information on how to design for debugging on switch mode power supplies and different precautions that you have to take for RF components. Thanks again.